The Rational Apprentice podcast is linear rather than topical. This means that the podcast should be listened to in order. This also means that skipping episodes will prevent you from fully understanding the concepts being presented and may cause you to miss or misconstrue vital proofs. That being said, welcome to the Rational Apprentice podcast. This week and next, I'll be out giving some live talks on the subject of volitional science. Now, this means that I'm essentially out of office. And while that might seem as though we're going to take a short break from our discussion on the scientific determination of rightness, well, we're not. Because I've pre-prepared a couple of interesting topics for you to listen to while I'm away. Today, I'm going to talk about how there's no such thing as settled science. This is the story of how the term settled science is not only oxymoronic, but a demonstration of the complete misunderstanding of the workings of the scientific method. Now, the story started long ago, but it continues today with something that's been in the news recently, the connections between depression and serotonin. Now, whether you suffer from clinical depression, mild depression, or no depression at all, this subject should be of interest because, as it turns out, it's a perfect real-world example of how well the scientific method actually works when it's properly applied. This is a real-world, as-it's-happening example of exactly what we've been discussing in the past three or four episodes here at the Rational Apprentice podcast. Now, in order to discuss this example, I'll be using the findings in the Journal of Molecular Psychiatry paper that was released in July of 2022, and which describes what was, for the past 25 years, deemed to be settled science when it came to the subject of depression and serotonin reuptake inhibitors. These are drugs like Prozac and Xanax. I'll also be linking to the paper and the supporting summary from the University College London, where the paper was created and released, and those will be in the show notes for the episode. So, and without going into too much medical detail, I'll use the paper to first describe what was assumed to be true. In other words, show the premises the original studies used to draw their conclusions. Second, will discern whether the conclusion was achieved through a logically valid method. And third, we'll check the premises for truth to determine if the conclusion is right. So in order to get started, I'll give you a little medical backstory so that we have a general idea of the subject at hand. Hey, I'm Scotty, and welcome to the Rational Apprentice Podcast, where we discuss solutions to humanity's problems derived from the application of the scientific method. We also discuss and practice things like logic and logical argumentation, reasoning and evidence, the unknown, forgotten, or underappreciated scientists and philosophers in our history, and of course, the mind over murder case of the week. I'm gonna to try to make this as simple as possible so that y- y- you could even explain it to your kids, all right? Illustrated diagrams for today's discussion are included in this week's Substack newsletter. You can subscribe for free at therationalapprentice.substack.com. All right, unlike electrical wires, which simply conduct electricity as long as there's no break in the wire, nerves are not directly connected. So in order for a signal from one nerve to be sent to another nerve and continue on down the line wherever they need to go, nerves need to be able to communicate with one another. But how is this done? Well, at the intersection of two nerve fibers are a pair of nodes called dendrites, which allow one nerve to communicate with the next. But, and this is really important, that communication only happens in one direction, okay? Communication is facilitated by something called serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter. The name certainly makes sense, right? A neuron is a nerve cell, and this allows nerve cells to transmit information from one cell to another. So, neurotransmitter. All right? At the end of the transmitting nerve fiber is the presynaptic nerve membrane. And at the beginning of the receiving nerve fiber is the postsynaptic nerve membrane. And between them is what's called the synaptic gap. This is figure A of the diagrams for those of you who are subscribed to my substack. All right, now, we have to get the nerve signal from the presynaptic nerve ending through that synaptic gap to the postsynaptic nerve beginning on the receiving nerve fiber. 
So how are we going to do that? Well, the presynaptic side creates and holds serotonin in vesicles, which are tiny containers. And the postsynaptic side has serotonin receptors. The presynaptic side releases serotonin, which diffuses through the gap, and gets picked up by the postsynaptic receptors on the other side, which fires the nerve and continues the signal on down the line. This is figure B in the diagrams. All right, so remember, this is all at the molecular level, and it all happens very quickly. Now, once we fired the receiving nerve, we need to get rid of the serotonin in the gap so that it doesn't continue to trigger the receiving nerve synapse. So how is that done? Well, four things happen. And now we're looking at figure C of the diagrams. First, some of the serotonin in the gap is immediately broken down by an enzyme. Second, some of the serotonin escapes the gap into the surrounding tissue, which is either broken down into a metabolite named, and this is, I don't know why it's named this, but 5-HIAAA. Or it remains in the blood plasma as serotonin, but it's no longer in the synaptic gap, so that's fine. But the bulk of the remaining serotonin in the gap is reabsorbed by the presynaptic membrane, essentially recycling the serotonin for use the next time it's needed. Okay, so these are the technical details in a nutshell of how nerve-to-nerve -nerve communication works. Now, based on that setup, the hypothesis 25 years ago was that there was a strong connection between serotonin level and depression. In other words, if there was too little serotonin in the transmitting dendrite, the preside, there would be diminished reception postside, and thus diminished communication between the nerves. So, by increasing the amount of serotonin remaining in the gap, you increase nerve stimulation and thus reduce depression. Now, that makes sense if you assume the strong connection between serotonin level and depression. And that's what serotonin reuptake inhibitors do. They inhibit the presynaptic nerve fiber from reabsorbing the released serotonin. That way, there's more serotonin in the gap and less is needed to fire the receiving synapse. So let's look at the truth of the premises and the validity of the deduction. Okay, so what we have here are three premises. First is poor synaptic communication depresses mood and causes depression. Second, diminished serotonin causes diminished synaptic communication. Third, Increased serotonin facilitates better synaptic communication. And the conclusion was, therefore, increasing serotonin will create a corresponding increase in synaptic communication, which will reduce depression. Okay, that sounds good. So what's the problem? Well, after years of studies, it turns out that there's no correlating relationship between the lack of serotonin and depression. Well, uh, huh? How did they find that out? Well, there were five primary study areas with multiple studies performed for each and all described in this molecular psychiatry paper. Again, the diagrams included in the newsletter will be very helpful in understanding the test areas. The test area groups are marked as figure D. All right, the first study area tested the hypothesis that if a person had reduced serotonin, there would be a corresponding reduction in the amount of the 5-H1AAA metabolite produced when the serotonin was broken down. But according to all the tests, the metabolite level is the same for people with and without symptomatic depression. The second area of study was much like the first and tested the hypothesis that if a person had reduced serotonin, there would be a corresponding reduction in the amount of serotonin in the blood plasma. But again, according to all the tests, the amount of serotonin in the blood plasma is the same for people with and without symptomatic depression. And the third area of study was quite interesting. Apparently, and this has been known to researchers for a long time, but apparently the body auto-regulates the number of serotonin receptors on the postsynaptic uh, membrane. If there's a lack of serotonin produced by the presynaptic nerve fiber, the postsynaptic nerve fiber will increase the number of serotonin receptors in order to offset the imbalance. The problem here is that the studies in the third area all found, 
the number of serotonin receptors in the postsynaptic nerve membrane is the same for people with and without symptomatic depression. The fourth study area tested tryptophan, something I'm sure you've heard of, if, especially if you live in America. For a number of years there, tryptophan was touted as the reason why so many people were fatigued after Thanksgiving dinner. But it turns out that that was bunk, and the much more obvious act of eating three times your body weight in sugary food was a much more likely cause. But that aside, tryptophan is an amino acid, which your body uses to make serotonin in the first place. So tryptophan is absorbed by the presynaptic nerve fiber and is converted into serotonin. The thought was that if people were tryptophan depleted, this would lead to a resultant lowering of serotonin levels, which makes sense. And that does happen. Lack of tryptophan does reduce serotonin levels. But as the studies in Area 4 found, the issue is people who are tryptophan depleted do not show a corresponding mood change as they should have were the hypothesis to be correct. And the final set of studies, Study Area 5, dealt with something called the CERT, S-E-R-T, molecule, which is the molecule that facilitates the reuptake, the reabsorption of serotonin back into the presynaptic membrane. Simply put, a person with more CERT molecules would logically absorb more of the released serotonin, reducing the amount remaining in the gap. But as it turns out, again, there's no correlation between those with more CERT molecules and those exhibiting depression. Okay, that's the gist of the paper's findings. And again, I encourage you to read the paper for yourself. Primary sources are always best. Okay, so let's restate the premises and the conclusion for the serotonin hypothesis. One, poor synaptic communication depresses mood and causes depression. Two, diminished serotonin causes diminished synaptic communication. Three, increased serotonin facilitates better synaptic communication. Therefore, increasing serotonin will create a corresponding increase in synaptic communication, which will in turn reduce depression. So, checking for validity, we have to assume that all three premises are true. If poor synaptic communication causes depression, and diminished serotonin causes diminished synaptic communication, and increased serotonin causes better synaptic communication, is it logically sound that by increasing serotonin, you reduce depression? Is that a valid conclusion based upon all three premises being true? Well, that is a valid conclusion based on all three premises being true. But now we have to check the premises for truth. First, does poor synaptic communication depress mood and cause depression? Well, we don't know whether this premise is true or not. Looking at the results detailed in the paper, it's not possible to tell. Let's, however, give it the benefit of the doubt and assume that after all these years, they have at least been looking in the right place. Okay, so we're going to call that one true. Second, diminished serotonin causes diminished synaptic communication. Well, according to all five studies, there didn't seem to be any correlation between serotonin levels and synaptic communication. So that is untrue. Third, is it true that increased serotonin facilitates better synaptic communication? Again, According to all five studies, there didn't seem to be any correlation between serotonin levels and synaptic communication. So again, this is untrue. So what is our conclusion here? We have an assumed true premise, a false premise, and a false premise, and a valid deduction. But here's what's interesting. There's quite a lot of data indicating that for some reason, serotonin reuptake inhibitors do indeed help those who suffer from depression but apparently scientists have no idea how it works or why it works. So was their conclusion right? Was the hypothesis right? Well, with two of the three premises untrue, no, of course not. I'm telling you, the scientific method works every time. So looking at our conclusion, we'd have to make some changes for it to be correct. 
We originally had serotonin reuptake inhibitors will increase synaptic serotonin, increasing synaptic communication, and thus reducing depression. But according to the latest findings, we'd have to tweak this a bit, and the best we can do now is to have it say, evidence suggests that serotonin reuptake inhibitors help to reduce depression, but scientists have no idea why or how. So the question now is why the conclusion was accepted as quote-unquote settled science when the premises were inadequately tested for truth. Now, it's likely that they simply didn't have the physics technology to do the studies back then. Any other conclusion, no matter how compelling, would be supposition. But one thing is for sure, once again, time is the great arbiter. And the scientific method, when used properly, will always come to the rescue. All right, everyone, that'll do it for today. Let me remind you that in order to get the weekly Mind Over Murder case notes, you'll need to sign up for the weekly Substack newsletter. In addition to the Mind Over Murder case notes, we'll have studies, practices, courses, and bonus materials coming out in the near future, and I know you're going to want to get a hold of those when they come out. So head on over to therationalapprentice.substack.com to sign up for free right now. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.